Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Boback. I'm uh, the development director for UK, Middle East and Africa. And so I've been working closely with um, the teams at NGN, uh, the broader organization, to frame some of our research about what's happening in the threat landscape in the Middle East with a specific focus on the financial sector. Um, at a high level, we see lots of different cybercrime that takes place on an international level on a daily basis. Um, but what's interesting is to take it down to a country level and start looking at it as a microcosm of the kind of risks that people are facing. And one of the more effective ways of doing this is to look at very basic types of cybercrime, which generally go around, for example, credit card fraud or account takeovers or other kinds of PII, for example, or leaked data sale which are often the first signs of interest in a region from a cybercrime perspective. In this, in this particular investigation and also presentation that we're going to be going through today, I'm going to be talking about a wide spectrum of cybercrime types. So not just card fraud, which I'm showing on the screen now, um, but in addition to that, um, issues like, for example, the different kinds of ta attacks that are happening across the Middle East. Obviously, we'll be touching on ransomware. We'll be talking about some financial services specific attacks uh, that we've seen in the past um, in the region and also globally. And finally, we'll be talking a little bit about nation state APT and the types of espionage and sabotage that are happening uh, across the Middle East region. So without further ado, I'll jump in because I know that we've got a bit of pressure for time. We're trying to cram in as much content for you guys this morning. And what we did in the last uh, reporting period to dive in here is we started to look at, you know, well, actually, what are the metrics for cybercrime in Bahrain currently? You know, where do we start from when we're going out and deciding to make a presentation? Well, how can we, how can we kind of um, get an understanding about what's going on? Well, the first thing we do is we start looking at the raw data types and what we did was we went out and examined all of the different dark web stores that were selling different kinds of credit cards for fraud. Now, generally speaking, on sale, um, currently in the global threat landscape, there are two types of credit cards that cyber criminals buy on the deep and the dark web. Uh, they buy them from stores or they buy from them from uh, Telegram chats or they buy them from even open websites. And we collect information about those cards being posted for sale and then obviously we then uh, categorize that and look into it in more detail. So in the period from the 1st of October through till uh, yesterday, uh, we're able to identify there are about 2,500 and 2,200 respectively compromised cards. Now the compromised credit cards in the top line, which is the 2,352, um, we're being, uh, that's basically all the data that's on a card, but it's not any of the um, track one or track two, i.e. The, the chip and pin data. So that might be, for example, information about the CVV code, uh, expiration dates, full card number, maybe some supporting information about the actual owner, their address, etc. I'll show you some examples in a minute. And we saw that these cards are being sold on average for about 18 and a half dollars and you know extrapolating from that we're able to identify the probable losses faced by the banking sector which would have been around you know 1.2 million US dollars um, in this calculation we haven't factored for really any um, of the additional losses that go around this kind of fraud and these kind of attacks and that could be for example loss of customer confidence it could be money leaving the economy it's it could be uh, users leaving the bank. Um, it could be additional impacts and uh, run-on effects onto their businesses. Um, so this is obviously just the losses that we see. And in order to sort of calculate some of those losses, we also looked at some of the advertisements that cyber criminals were putting up. And some of the figures that they were posting around the cards for Bahrain were significantly higher, as we'll touch on in the next slide. In addition to that, threat actors are also selling cards for cloning along with PIN data um, where it's available. If they don't have PIN data, they'll also just sell the card that can be used in swipe-based transactions. And again, the losses on these kind of cards are significant. 
there's a higher element of risk and more effort that goes into doing this kind of card fraud because you need to make a physical card, which is why the set, even though you make more money as a criminal stealing using this methodology, you're going to end up with a higher theft amount, which is why the losses per card here on this particular slide is, is generally higher. And this type of fraud is obviously because it's you know, going to have a physical element. Um, it's able to impact more. Um, and, you know, it'll normally look like, for example, a shopping spree or a series of transactions that have happened using a physical card, but either in a new region or, you know, in a series of shops that the end user normally doesn't use. So we're seeing these kind of changes to the threat landscape. And I look back a little bit further in our data, and it does look as though this kind of growth of cybercrime has been relatively steady. Uh, across the GCC, but also um, that extends to Bahrain. At the moment, um, I was thinking about this in the global perspective because you know these aren't enormous numbers yet. Um, but one of the important things you know, to bear in mind is that um, once or cyber criminals begin to target an, an organized an area, and they then see that that is effective, they then become more and more active and the per capita losses and the per capita targeting becomes significantly higher and unfortunately that looks as though what's happening in Bahrain so although there's a in terms of the total losses um, that are happening through credit card fraud on that's tracked on the deep in the dark web you know Bahrain is is quite a small percent but then if you compare that to the global population um, and then compare it on a per capita basis, say, to the United Kingdom uh, or to, you know, Europe or to the United States, the figures are, you know, coming up to being almost equal, uh, which can be, you know, a bit of a concern because we do see that across other countries in the GCC, obviously Saudi, the UAE, um, there's been massive increases in fraud and they are more targeted per capita than Bahrain currently. But that's a trend that will be expected to continue. So there is a large amount of attacks happening. Um, and on a per capita basis, the Middle East is disproportionately targeted. So I think that's the strategic takeaway to take from this slide. It's obviously you can look into the figures. You can say, oh, that's a lot of money. You can say that isn't a lot of money. I think the, the amounts of money currently are immaterial. The point of this presentation is to say that the threat landscape is currently changing. and the Middle East is being increasingly targeted for cybercrime. And this can happen in ebbs and flows. You can see, though, that, for example, cards are being posted almost on a daily basis. You might have some of these red lines, which represent large increases in the amount of cards being put up, which could be you know, a series of ATM skimmers being that have then been put onto the market, or it could be that there's a, a series of, you know, for example, breaches that then lead to credit card data being stolen and put up on the dark web. Uh, we've obviously taken from October of 2020 forward. As you can see, there have been some big breaches in the past. Um, but if we run the data back to 2019, um, there was almost nothing. So I think the conclusion is that, and we've seen this across the GCC, that, that if you average it all out, just it's a, an increasing wave, unfortunately of different types of cybercrime, whether it's for card not present based fraud, whether it's for um, track one and track two cloned cards, uh, the attacks are increasing. And an example of this, and where, for example, we try to support some of our data around our findings, um, we're just looking for relatively recent posts. So I pulled one up from yesterday um, by a threat actor called Dr. Zeller. You can actually search for him if you have a Telegram application search for Dr. and then Zella. You can do it on your screen now. And you'll see a number of accounts come up in the Telegram chat. And this particular cyber criminal um, posts his uh, stolen credit cards up for sale in this account and takes money. And um, obviously then is conducting fraud. And one of the credit card numbers that he was then selling or credit cards he was selling was a one with a $1,806 balance that was obviously located uh, in Bahrain. So I think it's illustrative that this is happening at scale, but it's useful for you guys to be able to put, you know, sink your teeth into that. There's obviously large amounts of cards that are being put up. Um, they're put up with the 
also for I guess general education purposes, this is a screenshot from a, a, a large underground store called Bingo.hi, and the cards are put up on here on sale. In the left hand side, you can see the credit card numbers. You can see the expiration dates that have been applied. You can see the type of credit card. You can see the bank affected. The bank affected um, is identified using open bin number information. So like public bin data, it's broadly available. So you can have the first six digits and then they obviously don't post the full card number. They remove, the criminals remove some of the content and you know use that in order to obfuscate their activity. And then additional information like parts of the addresses, um, the cities, the countries obviously then provided and you can see the information about the victim. So like the telephone, which is this line of ticks or the email, which is this line here as well. And also the validity ratio, which is this percentage marker here. You can see the level of organization that cyber criminals are now going into. Uh, and the amount of data that they have in order to support their frauds. Uh, they know exactly which financial institutions they're targeting and they are, you know, I would say in a strong position when it comes to fraud. And this is why we have to be increasingly aware and raising, um, raising, what I would say, knowledge, raising and providing information about this kind of attack, because these kinds of attacks, because it feeds into um, the different and other kinds of cybercrime that can happen. And that could be the theft of personal data, that could be um, increasing in skill level of different cyber criminals, so they might move from doing credit card fraud to then doing attacks like ransomware. And obviously we can see other, for example, cards um, here that relate to Bahrain. Um, but I do want to pivot here um, and talk a little bit more broadly. I'm aware that we've got a limited amount of time today. Um, but at the same time, it's not all about fraud in the cyberspace. And I talked briefly about ransomware. Um, just to finish off on the, on the crowd fraud front though, I think it's indicative that everything across the board is increasing now. So it could be credit card fraud, it could be leaks, it could be breaches. And I think one of the things that is, is really worth putting out there, and it's talking about volumes, you know, there's 40,000, you know, credit cards, for example, that are being put up over the course of six months. I oh, know, not 40,000, sorry, $40,000 in cybercrime revenue of cards and around, um, I believe, 5,000 cards total um, that are being put up on these underground forums. So there's multiple instances of attacks. And, you know, we're also seeing that um, effectively Bahrain is being targeted as well um, across other attack types. They just might not be as visible. Um, whether that's because, for example, ransomware attacks are hidden frequently by organizations. No one wants to know that, you know, their customers to know that they've been hacked. Um, it could be that PII is now also being stolen. There are many, many kinds of attacks. I think the credit card data shows the frequency uh, and the financial impact of this very easily. But there are other Bahrain specific attacks. So one of the ones that we identified and investigated was by a threat actor called Scarface who is avatars on the screen, is actually um, on raid forums. I've obfuscated the name of the organization um, that was affected. But I think the key point is that this particular threat actor was you know, choosing to target Bahrain. He was identifying that there's a market for data about Bahrain, so people want to buy it, there's money out there for it. Now, we actually investigated and talked to this specific threat actor um, who was posting on an underground forum called Redforce. Um, we just talked to him from, so to him from messengers. From that, we were able to establish that the um, posts that he was putting up, the attack in Bahrain, were actually uh, not true, i.e. he had just taken, he said he'd got all of the emails and backup data. He'd actually just taken in these email addresses off of the open internet and then see how password related to them. But I think the key point here, much like the card fraud, is about illustrating the trend. Late January or early Feb. And at the particular time, um, I was surprised, you know, surprise in order to see the bar was being targeted and that people were interested in having this data. And I think that's the fundamental change. And that's that the fact is, if we go up to macro level um, and we look across not just happening in Bahrain, but also happening across the whole mid, you know, 
there have been threats like Jordan Rue, who have been heavily targeting Saudi Arabia, the UAE. He's not yet targeted uh, Bahrain, uh, to our knowledge. But we're seeing individual cyber criminal threat actors now heavily targeting the Middle East. And whether that's because of, um, I would say, uh, a la- uh, maybe it's geopolitical reasons, maybe it's just because there's more money. And I think the market size and has been basically just grown to the sense where people now see that they can make good money out of targeting the mist, as we saw with the great quick model. And accordingly, now operationalizing their capabilities and targeting um, different organizations. And it could be anything. It could be, we've got some screenshots here, you know, health insurance providers. Um, I mean, we've seen everyone from, and this is primarily just for access cell or data theft. We don't, we're not even talking about ransomware operators just yet. We're talking about people who are stealing data or collecting, for example, university, you know, data sets, people's names, their passport numbers, their telephones for use in these kind of fraud attacks. Um, this is now happening increasingly often and um, there's a market for it. People are making you know, hundreds if not thousands of dollars off of each individual attack. And so we're seeing the actors who are performing these kind of um, incidents, they might be uh, Russian speaking in origin, so from Ukraine or from Belarus, or from Russia or Kazakhstan, but we're also seeing a new level of attacks as well, and that's that increasingly there's a, a wave of Turkish cyber criminals who are also, and North African cyber criminals who are also targeting the GCC. And uh, this isn't something that we necessarily foretold, but it's certainly become clear that the cybercrime ecosystem has really developed a market of its own in order to target the Middle East. So unfortunately, this will then, you know, this targeting of, you know, Amman or um, let's say Qatar or Saudi Arabia or the UAE, obviously this will eventually have an impact and start overflowing into affecting the cybersecurity um, of Bahraini organizations because of the increased volume of attacks and the fact that there is now, I would say, a mature market for different types of data, different types of ancillary information um, on individual victims, on companies, on data, on credit card information focused around the Middle East. So we have a threat actor that we chose to focus on who's targeting a large amount of Arabic speaking countries. He's interesting because he shows the kind of development of um, what kind of targeting happens across the Middle East. And he started very early on um, in May of 2020. And he was just selling actually just a um, an exploit. And he was trying to get um, money for selling this exploit. And uh, one of the things that people, he realized is he put this exploit up for sale, as you can see here, but actually he then um, was asked, well, actually, we don't necessarily want your exploit, but can you sell us all of the data that's related to it? And then this then led to him targeting multiple different organizations everywhere from Egypt all the way through to um, KSA um, and conducting, I think, between 20 to 40 different breaches that he publicly disclosed and provided data upon. We're able to then focus in on this individual actor um, using some of our intelligence capabilities. We're able to link his activity to an open web profile and then pass that information over to law enforcement agencies. So he seems to be less active now. I don't know whether that's a factor of um, his um, attacks or whether that's a factor of um, him being arrested by um, law enforcement. But I think one thing that we've neglected to touch on so far, and I'm aware that we are, um, you know, coming up to a relatively hard stop in a few minutes, is that we've also neglected to touch on APTs and advanced threat actors. So one of the key areas that we've touched on is the growth of cybercrime. I think this is one of the things that I'm very keen to get across on this particular presentation today, is that um, cybercrime is now a very real issue. Um, whether it's from card fraud, um, whether it's from PII theft, obviously we can talk about ransomware, but there are other attacks that are very much relevant to the financial sector. Bahrain being a country with a very developed financial sector, it's worth thinking 
about not just these you know, cybercrime elements or, for example, APTs for nation state and espionage by attacks, but also, um, you know, what are the additional threats? What are the more exotic threats that are happening to the financial sector? So, firstly, it's worth noting that, you know, you do have large amounts of ransomware. I'll just touch on this slide first. I mean, uh, there were multiple different ransomware incidents that we're seeing across the Middle East that we're responding to, many of them in the financial sector. Um, we performed an incident response, um, in fact, in Egypt recently, where it took three hours. Once the network had been breached, um, it took three hours for them to entirely crypto lock a very large financial institution. Um, now, that's immediately extends them thinking, well, okay, crypto locking ransomware is going to take place. And you guys will have been seeing that. There have been incidents of ransomware and crypto locking inside of Bahrain that you, in the local community and in information security, will all be aware of. But there's also other kinds of attacks that can happen. You know, ransomware is um, very simple. It's a very big problem. It's something that everyone should be focused on. But there are other risks that we do face. Obviously, we've touched on PII. We've touched on card data. Additionally, for financials, it's worth noting that many of the systems that you guys carry for financial services processing are also at target. So it could be your SWIFT systems, um, maybe, for example, um, the switching system for card transactions might be vulnerable. You may have the risk of threat actors gaining uh, access to card processing and issuing, for example, credit cards in their names or taking mule credit cards increasing the limits on those and using those for cash outs. You can have um, logical attacks on the ATM systems. So that's jackpotting the ATMs with ATM malware through the ATM controller systems inside the bank. Or you can just have people abusing core banking platforms in order to um, increase or decrease account balances for then further theft or perform transfers. So we see quite a rich uh, financial APT landscape. Uh, groups like Money Taker, Silence, Cobalt, um, obviously nation states even such as the North Koreans with Lazarus have been targeting heavily the financial sector. And I think it's worth noting that with the increase in the value of Bitcoin, uh, for any of you if you are involved in any exchanges that might be um, based in uh, Bahrain, obviously Bitcoin exchanges are heavily targeted at the moment because they hold large amounts of cryptocurrency, which obviously very valuable right now. So the increased sort of more and more interesting, more complex attacks against financial institutions through these, I would say, non-standard theft methods. You know, you, most people expect, for example, that when they're going to be hacked, it's going to be a ransomware incident. Actually, there, there are many kinds of other infrastructure that can be targeted during a financial information security incident. And accordingly, um, I just wanted to draw a couple of those to your attention and obviously a number of these threats like um, money take or silence, etc., or all of these reports, in fact, are available via our website. If you want to go into more detail, look at the TTPs, so the tactic techniques and procedures used by the groups, or if you want to receive accurate MITRE mapping onto the attack framework, you'll be able to find that information there too. I think a final point, <clears throat> as I'm aware that we're quite pressed for time, is that um, there's obviously a continued threat of uh, nation state level APTs. So uh, financial institutions, government institutions, um, private companies, obviously at risk from not just um, you know the threats that we've in, we've outlined, um, you know whether it's PI theft, ransomware, card fraud, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Espionage remains a very large threat. I think the everyone's aware that the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East is complex. And there's, a, I would say, a disproportionately large amount of targeting and active threat groups in the Middle East currently relative to anywhere else in the world. Um, we obviously at Group IB work globally. And we look at the threat landscape, for example, for, you know, it could be a country like Australia, uh, or it could, and we'd be performing incident response, or it could be somewhere in South America like Colombia. And there are very, very few places where the amount of state versus state uh, espionage campaigns are as high, as frequent, or as targeted. And um, you can see groups like um, 
I've, I've mentioned here a number of Iranian groups, but obviously there are various different threat actor groups from various different countries across the GCC and also outside of the GCC. So, you know, Chinese, um, Russian, United States, the UK, where I'm sitting, uh, all of these uh, countries and institutions are performing espionage. You know, they say that they have cyber armies, they're conducting incidents, um, and they're using tools. Now, obviously, they're focusing on areas of interest to them, which frequently lie in geopolitically active areas such as the Middle East. And that then drives hacking, that drives espionage. And in some cases, as I'm sure you're all aware, it does also drive uh, sabotage. So we've seen, for example, in the financial sector, after data has been stolen, threat actors trying to obfuscate or hide the fact that they've been active in networks and then using crypto locking tools in order to hide the fact that they've stolen data. Um, much like uh, the not picture attacks that took place in Ukraine. Um, similarly, we saw the attacks like that happen in Southeast Asia uh, by Chinese nation state APTs. And obviously we have, you know, the big example, which is uh, the usage of crypto locking tools for sabotage, um, as was conducted by Iran um, relatively, well, relatively early on in the cycle of cybersecurity development. Um, with, I recall, flame being used. So this is really the, the, the unfortunate state of affairs. Um, I think the, the takeaways are just that the problem is unfortunately continuing and increasing in severity. Um, it's now become an arms race where obviously people are beginning to invest seriously in cybersecurity in, for example, security operation centers, um, outsourcing some of those functions, getting the headcount, getting the budgets that they need. Um, but it's certainly um, a game of cat and mouse where we'll be chasing and working with our partners in order to make sure that they're well defended so that these threats then migrate to other easier targets, which is ultimately our goal is to make sure that you're protected and make sure that your assets and infrastructure, as well as your customers and your employees are well protected in Quite a difficult period, I think, in the last year with the COVID, uh, COVID risk uh, continuing to grow. So on that juncture, I don't want to uh, over overrun too much, as I believe um, I'm now getting a couple of messages from our lovely organizers saying, Tim, unfortunately, it's uh, it's about time that you uh, finish up. So I'll go on to the last side, and uh, I'll also open up the floor. Um, and see if there are any questions that we can uh, that we can take from the audience. So thank you very much. Hi, hello. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, thank you, team, uh, for your uh, presentation. And first of all, I would like to welcome uh, everyone to joining our first uh, NGN Majelis uh, event. I hope it is the start of the good tradition. Then we, you know, where we can share our thoughts and uh, the, you know. The recent practices that we have in Bahrain. So my name is Ilya Leonov. I'm uh, handling the security practice direction in NGN International. And today I would like to discuss with you, uh, so if we have time, uh, yeah, to discuss with you the evolution of the security roles uh, in, in, in cybersecurity. Okay, so the evolution of cybersecurity roles and uh, responsibilities. Um, as you know, uh, we are now living in the new paradigm, new reality, and we are facing a lot of new challenges. Um, first of all, um, during this pandemic situation and a lot of changes uh, across the organization processes and environment, we see the transition between from the traditional perimeter security where we are keeping the business assets in the safe place to the zero trust. I'm sure that you are aware of this approach, but uh, for whom who do not know, the zero trust is means that we need to, um, to protect our users, to protect our data and assets, uh, regardless of the location of this particular data or, or user. So, as, you, as we can see that this lead to the more complex and sophisticated attacks because users are, let's say, distributed, the environment are distributed. So it leads to the 
complex and sophisticated attacks. Here we can define like a two groups and uh, Tim already mentioned some of them in his presentation. First of all, definitely we see a huge spike in the common attacks like uh, different uh, ways of phishing, wishing or smishing, data leakage, a new malware. So this is the what we can see uh, nowadays with the, what, what the users are faced of. And definitely the complex attacks, like again, as Tim mentioned, the ransomware, he highlighted some of the cases in Bahrain, but I'm sure that you are also aware about the latest case with the Acer uh, Corporation, where the ransomware group asked them uh, for the 50 millions of US dollars to, you know, to decrypt the, the data. And some additional you know, sophisticated targeted attacks like uh, SolarWinds case. I'm sure that everyone is aware and it was the huge hype uh, in the last year um, about the, this particular attack on SolarWinds. So what is the idea on all of this uh, situation that we have now? That it is create a huge load on the IT operations, on the security operations, because um, IT teams now they are you know worried about the user protection, about uh, you know migration some production services to the to the cloud or to the uh, let's say disaster recovery uh, sites. So all of these factors create uh, like a huge load on the IT and security teams. Definitely in that case, um, this information security become like a more uh, heavier in terms of the business operations. So they, um, let's say, involved in the two different areas, as we can see again. So definitely it is the risk and compliance. The CISO nowadays, they are worried about the local regula regulations, industry standards. They need to, uh, let's say, develop a new policies and procedures to, let's say, be more um, aligned with the nowadays business requirements and needs. But also what we uh, see from uh, today's situation, it's the huge increase of the practical security that the companies, they are worried about the uh, monitoring and response of uh, security threats. Because as I told previously, the environment is uh, distributed and the users, they are located in the different, uh, let's say, areas, and they're working from the different environment. So we need to somehow monitor and uh, properly respond on uh, potential threats. Also, we see, um, you know, some new roles like uh, threat hunters, forensic investigations, even um, some big uh, uh, organizations, they are like a create a specific roles in the information security departments for the threat hunters and forensic investigations to you know be more specific um, because you need to like have a dedicated resource to uh, to do the uh, threat hunting and find uh, some vulnerabilities and hidden uh, malware in your infrastructure or on the user side on the endpoints and obviously the security devops uh, as we can see you know during this migration processes and uh, uh, again the distributed environment we need to make sure that from the security point of view all the uh, production systems they are well integrated and uh, everything uh, is working properly and not affected on the business processes so um, i would not take a lot of your time so i would like to let's say uh, keep some time for the discussion. I just want to conclude uh, that um, this transformation journey in cybersecurity definitely it will continue and the connection between uh, business requirements and IT operations, security operations, this connection will be closer and I'm sure that in the couple of uh, in the coming years we will see some new roles, some new areas in cybersecurity. So, yeah, I think we will see some new, um, let's say, directions um, 
in this field. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I will pass, uh, pass the word to Mr. Hassan from uh, KFH. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to present uh, to you today. And I really appreciate this opportunity from uh, NGN. And this is a great initiative from NGN as a company, uh, keeping in mind the increasing uh, uh, number of attacks and uh, the global threat uh, vector around us. So uh, for companies uh, specialized in information security, it's a great initiative to introduce the new threats, the recent attacks, the recent uh, information to everyone around them, uh, not only customers, also for peers, attendees from, uh, from the country. So this will uh, help everyone in the case's awareness level and of course, this will be a good, uh, great potential for uh, future business as well. So now, uh, speaking as a customer of NGN services, I have been with them since a year now and I have uh, been using their services. Uh, I really appreciate uh, their approach dealing with information security and uh, the, the, new, the, the recent cyber security attacks and threats uh, around us. And this is uh, a great opportunity also for Bahrain to, to understand what's happening uh, globally. So I haven't prepared a, a specialized presentation. It's not like a, a training exercise here, but I have a few ideas or uh, concepts that I would like to discuss here. Uh, one, like we have some hot spots or some hot topics that are worth mentioning. Uh, keeping in mind everything that being said by uh, 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 Ilya and uh, the team here in NGN, we have seen that we have many recent attacks happening, uh, ransomware attacks, zero-day attacks, but the vulnerability-related attacks, uh, the recent solar wind uh, incident. Also, we have the recent Microsoft incident that happened last uh, month, I think, related to Microsoft Exchange. So this is an endless loop. Uh, for us, an information security field, it's really difficult and tough and challenging to keep, to keep up with all of this. Now, speaking uh, as, as an expert, working in, in information security for uh, more than 10 years now, and coming back from an IT background, and now I know both worlds. Speaking from IT, I know the challenges those people face to keep the systems up to date and to uh, upgrade within the budget allocated to them. Also, from information security perspective, I know the challenges from compliance, regulatory, and data governance perspective, which is really difficult at, at some times. Now, looking at the increasing uh, rate of business transformation and uh, the nature of uh, business in, in general. Now, if you look at 2020 and the COVID-19 situation, companies were forced to increase their complexity level. They, they are forced to, to do a lot of business transformation they are uh, doing a lot of digital uh, initiative now all of these doesn't come without any risks doesn't come without any threats to the organizations so keeping in mind the new rules the new laws coming around us from uh, gdpr to pdpl in bahrain we have to consider all the data protection related aspects as well so uh with these points on the screen, increased organization co complexity, data protection, business transformation, regulatory complexity and changes, volatility, and recent global attacks, we have few hot spots or areas to look at from information risk security perspective, from risk management perspective, also from a business management perspective. We need to prepare ourselves for the new projections. We need to have a plan. We, we need to have a clear strategic initiative toward 2021 and for the coming five years at least. This is the short-term goal. We need to upgrade our security and risk perspective. We need to rethink how we look at information security and cybersecurity threats, not only from uh, IT perspective, not only from attack, attacking perspective, also from business east perspective and in a way to, to help and facilitate or, or provide the, uh, the right layers for business to, to perform their digital initiatives and digital transformation successfully. Now, from risk perspective, we are, we are aware of the fact that we have many zero-day attacks and vulnerabilities coming every month. Every month we're we are seeing a new vulnerability. Almost 
uh, uh, half to one percent of the attacks are coming from zero day attacks, zero day vulnerabilities that nobody knows about, no vulnerability tool can detect, and no information security uh, uh, consultant or firm can tell you, tell you about it. Even the major vendor like Microsoft, Google, uh, SolarWinds got attacked, nobody knows what happened. Nobody knew about the vulnerability. It was there for, for months. It was detected and discovered uh, late, unfortunately. And the, the, what was the consequences? Major loss, major, major breach. Looking at the, at the field, uh, Ilya also mentioned the same point. The recent uh, increased, increased number of attacks on Bahrain and the region itself. The whole region is, is, is experiencing an increasing number of attacks coming towards the financial sector, towards people uh, using financial services. Phishing attacks, we have smishing attacks, we have vishing attacks, we have many other ransomware uh, attacks. Distributed denial of service attacks coming towards organizations. The, the amount of the investment required to fight all of this is huge. CISOs, information security experts are suffering. They are now under huge pressure from their business, uh, from their companies, and also from the, the global, uh, the, the increasing number of global attacks. They need to keep up with all of this. At the same time, they need to maintain compliance with the regula regulatory and laws. So I, I believe uh, most of the CISOs in the, in the field are facing the same challenges. Uh, we need to rethink our approach. We need to rethink our uh, talent in information security. The, the unemployment rate of IT security professionals is almost zero, and this is a statistics coming from Gartner, from other sources. So the requirement for an expert, the, an expert information security uh, employees is increasing. And I do suggest personally that the new generation, the millennials, should focus on this uh, field. We don't, have, uh, we don't have much people in information security, especially women. Uh, for ladies, they, they need to, to, to focus on this field as well. Ladies in information security is a, a welcome uh, added value. Uh, we, we need to understand the, the, the numbers around us. Statistics say 40% rise in critical infrastructure and security projects. So this is happening. Uh, this is not a, a plan. It is already happening. Companies are investing a lot in information security. This will require many, many new uh, expertise in the field. We can't always rely on uh, consultants or uh, Companies, it's not always feasible for, for small businesses, medium-sized businesses. 45% of cloud misconfiguration or mistakes, it's happening due to human error. So these numbers do matter actually. So we need proper training, we need proper support from organizations around us. And I believe companies like NGN can really help. They can add value in the market. They have training centers. They have managed security services. I believe more companies should have uh, similar initiatives. From the government side, I, be, I believe also we need some support, more support to, to come from the government toward the, the information security training. We do appreciate everything being provided by Temkin to Bahraini citizens. But I believe we are always uh, late compared to attackers. They are ahead of us. They have more time, they have more resources, especially attacking groups like coming from uh, terrorism organizations, APT groups. They have more resources compared to us working in information security field. We need to think of automation. 60% almost of automation, attain, uh, per the percentage of automation requirement is the number and increasing by 60%. Automation tools for social engineering, for uh, IT, IT uh, infrastructure for information security. We need to have security orchestration services. We need to have threat detection and response. 
We can no longer monitor, monitor information security incidents manually. We can no longer take a, a, uh, an action like you can say firefighting mode. We, we need to be proactive. We need to have automated tools that can detect incidents and fix them on the spot. Block attackers on the spot. Detection of data leakage. We need automation tools. And I believe NGN do have uh, services related to automation, but we need to have more in the, in the region here, in Bahrain, especially in Bahrain. We, Bahrain is known for great financial services, and we are almost, I believe we are the center of FinTech in, in, in the region, the hub of FinTech. And the recent initiatives uh, announced by Bahrain, uh, by CBB, by the government, they are all going toward FinTech transformation, digital transformation. We need more automation. We can no longer work with manual tools. We need automated tools. Now, looking at the automation and the financial sector and the digital initi initiatives and transformation happening around us, we still have many companies who, who are considered financial or partially dealing with financial transactions. They are not complying with uh, data data payment security standards like PCI DSS. This is the the the, the mo most uh, uh, common one. It's used in Bahrain and it's forced by CBB. So we have many companies not complying with PCI DSS payment card uh, and data security standard. So this is a problem. Uh, we need to have more uh, talent. We need to have more intelligence around this. We need to have more awareness. We need to increase the the training for this uh, certification or standard. People assign consultants to do it for them, but they are not aware how to keep the compliance level going on year after year. With the number of changes happening in the field in IT and the business, you need to reconsider. You need to do uh, another gap assessment every year to, to make sure you are complying with the standard. So this is also a challenge for us in information security. Uh, Keeping everything said in mind, the, the, the investment is increasing almost by 100% compared to three years back. I can say, I, I will not go 10 years back, I will say three years back. The, the amount we are putting, the money we are putting in the information security investments increased almost 100%. Year, year on year growth attained by the number of cloud assessment projects executed, executed by companies is also increasing. 80% of of cybersecurity attacks is happening on the financial sector. So uh, on the other hand, you need to have more investment in the information security tools and uh, equipments. Now, this is one of the challenging uh, points. 84% of companies at some time, they got hacked or compromised. The problem is many of these companies they are not aware that they are hacked or they are not aware they are uh, compromised. So to look at the, the dependencies here, now in 2020 and 2021, we have more than 80% in, in increased, in, increased uh, level in the utilization, utilizing remote uh, access tools, cloud. We are utilizing the, the cloud services by 80%. We are utilizing remote access tools more than 80%. Now, people, I don't think people will go back to normal anytime soon in the future. Companies already tried the, this type of uh, working environment, and I believe they like it. They will continue using this. It is uh, a cost saving approach and more convenient approach also for, for people, for, for employees. But with that, we need to have more investment. We need to take care of all devices used to access our companies remotely. We need to have proper security uh, management for all of these devices, laptops, computers, patching, uh, remote patching, antivirus, um, uh, multi-factor authentication for VPN connections. So we said over 80% are concerned that they are already hacked, but they don't, do, they don't know it. This means we need to have more investment, more awareness level also for staff. They need to be aware how to detect uh, cybersecurity incidents. It will start like with the, the smallest, you know, the smallest uh, uh, chain, the uh, part of the chain, or the weakest, the weakest part in the chain is, is the staff itself, the employees, the users, end users. We need to increase the level of awareness for them. 
we, we can we can't only rely on on uh, the information security or IT departments. We need to to teach and uh, educate users to uh, on how to detect information security incidents, threats like phishing, social engineering, uh, smishing, and phishing. We we can see and we can. Uh, we predict that there will be a 15% uh, growth and demand in the cloud services by 2025. And th there are statistics saying it could be more than 50%. That the amount, the investment being put into information security and digital transformation projects and information security forensic uh, projects is more than 10 billion worldwide. So, by 2023, there are an estimation, and as per Gartner, the source is Gartner, 30% of information security officers and uh, chief information security officers will, 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 will need to directly measure their uh, ability to work, to, to, to provide to the business. What exactly they are achieving, achieving for their businesses. It's not about having the latest certification. It's about enabling business to, to perform digital transformation, to perform the recent digital initiatives and uh, provide an easier easier solution for customers like uh, digital uh, uh, EKYC, digital onboarding for financial services. This will require a lot of investment and a lot of focus from information security experts to enable these companies. And this is a, like some ideas that I had in mind I wanted to discuss and I wanted to present to you guys. Uh, if you have any question for me, and uh, you are welcome. I hope uh, this was uh, informative and beneficial to you. Thank you very much. So I hope that, uh, again, uh, as I start, these sessions will, um, will help us to grow together and uh, bring more, I would say, uh, awareness and uh, like the, the current status of the cybersecurity situation in, in the region and in Bahrain especially. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Um, we start our Q&A uh, session, so please, you can text uh, the messages in the text box, so and the moderators, they will uh, address them to the, to the presenters, I assume. So, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, text it in the message box. Yeah, thank you, Gert, for your question. Definitely uh, all the materials uh, will be available and we will uh, share uh, this information with the attendees. If, if you, Hassan, don't mind to share this, uh, your presentation as well. Sure, 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 no worries. I will do that. Eli, I have a question for you. Uh, sure. Something came into my mind and I think the answer will help the attendees uh, uh, get some idea. Now, keeping in mind all the points that I have mentioned, mm -hmm. do you have an NGN, a strategic initiative or a plan to, to, make, to fulfill or provide these services in, in, in Bahrain in the coming one or two or three years? What ex, what's your approach? Well, what you are planning to do? Yeah, this is the great uh, point and very important uh, topic, I would say. I, I will not uh, create here uh, some, let's say, portfolio description of NGN services. I just want to say that this initiative should be supported uh, through the um, regulator point of view. So I strongly believe that uh, all the uh, security practitioners and the companies who are doing the cybersecurity in Bahrain and in the region, also with the organizations, with the banks, with the CISOs, and we need to work very closely together and uh, definitely with the Central Bank of Bahrain to bring this initiatives to discuss uh, them and um, make the uh, regulatory part, uh, the law, uh, I would say, baseline in Bahrain very clear. And uh, we, we need to make sure that um, the regulatory part is uh, like uh, clear for all of the, let's say, um, players, I would say, in, in the market from the uh, information security side or from the organization point of view. So, yeah, this is my idea. Thank, thank you, Elia. Now I see, I can see a question coming from my cousin, Hussein Arabi. Okay. Uh, the answer yes. is simple. 
Now, for financial sector, is the, it is more organized because these companies, they do have legal department. So for PDPL, it is easier for, for companies with legal department to assign a PDPL champion or a data privacy or data protection officer, or we call it a champion. Uh, and from the other departments like IT and information security, by default, if you are compliant with PCI DSS, if you are compliant with the information security standard like ISO 27001, by default, you need to, to protect customer data, the PII, personal identifier, identifying information. So this is by default should be covered. Now, what is the difference from PDPL perspective? Is the consent form, for example, when you are collecting data from customers, you need to take their consent. You need to, to ask them for approval before you can store this data, before you can share this data with other business, or maybe if you, have, if you are in a, a group of companies, you have like subsidies or you have like sister companies. Uh, in this case, you need to take uh, approval from customers before sharing their data. And customers should have the right to, to ask for their data to be deleted or withdrawn. Like they can ask for a copy of all their data. Similarly, if you can see this is happening worldwide in all uh, major websites uh, from GDPR perspective. PDPL is similar, but for Bahrain only. Now, uh, the challenge is, is still there is no clear picture from the government who is responsible for enforcing this law. So for example, now we go as a, as a customer, you go to the barber shop or you go to the supermarket. Many businesses around you can ask you for, for your personal data, like your ID number, CPR. Now, uh, I believe we should, we should have the right to say no, why you need this information. This is what PDPL about. And these companies also should give you a proper justification why they need the information. So this is in general. Uh, I hope this answers your question, Hussein, and uh, the others, I believe, they're asking about the same uh, PDPL as well. So PDPL is still, it's, it's, we can say it's still in the beginning, implementing PDPL, enforcing the law. It's still in the, big, in the, in the beginning, early phases or early stages. Uh, in, in major organization, uh, large organization like banks, it is known they have taken all the necessary uh, steps to, to create policies, procedures, documentation, systems to make sure they are on, in line and compliant with the law. But small businesses, uh, people awareness is still, uh, still challenging. I, I believe we need to increase the awareness level also amongst the people in Bahrain regarding this law and about their rights. I agree, agree with you, Hassan. I would just uh, would like to add the small thing here. Um, you mentioned that the big enterprises, they are aware, but the small businesses are, let's say, not uh, clearly follows the, you know, the regulations, because again, it's not uh, so, let's say, uh, clear for now. So simple question all the uh, let's say uh, coffee shops and restaurants now they are require you to fill the form where you need to put your name cpr phone number uh, which is actually the your personal data and does anyone ask uh, them how you are store uh, this information so what you are doing with all these forms with all your uh, information about the like a cpr as i said phone number and the name so it is the long journey and I um, think that uh, definitely the PDPL should be let's say revised in the um, you know to improve uh, some statements there to make it clear for all the players in the market also the awareness for the people and especially small businesses should be increased as well thank you Elia there was, there's another question here about PDPL who is going to regulate it hmm. now as per my knowledge, uh, the government, I believe, assigned uh, a new organization or a new authority to do that. I don't have clear, uh, uh, clear ideas about it, how they were regulated. Still, still as I said, it's in, the, it's in the early stages. And I believe what happened is this law where, like, it, it went active in 2019, in August, and then COVID came. So uh, that was the, the major challenge for them to enforce this law. Yeah, imagine uh, implementing or, or saying PDPL is active and then COVID came and now people are requested to provide their information. So 
if you look at it from this uh, from this uh, like corner from this uh, point of view it is challenging and it is difficult for the government also to 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 force it i do understand the situation yeah, just a short uh, comment uh, here from the, uh, let's say, um, practice in the Europe or, or other countries that such um, regulations like a PDPL or data pro any other data protection laws, it's regulated by Ministry of uh, Information or Ministry of uh, Digitalization, something like that. So it is not uh, related to the for example, any specific area of the regulatory, like a central bank, as we have uh, here, it's more like a, it's have more uh, wider uh, coverage, and it's regulated from the, I would say, higher uh, government institutes. That's very good. Uh, hopefully, we'll see some some progress soon. So. We need to be ready, and this is what I what I, what I can uh, elaborate on. I, this is the, like the suggestion to everyone coming from the field. If you are in a company and you know that you'll be required to 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 fulfill the requirements of PDPL, be ready now. Don't wait, because they will they will hit you suddenly uh, without knowing, and then you will face some penalties. Maybe so be ready. Sure, sure, definitely. We all need to be to be ready. Okay, so thank, I, you, Eli. thank you, Eli. Thank you, thank, thank you, Hassan. Much. Thank you very Hassan, much for I thank your you valuable very much. points. Uh, Eli, I thank you. Hassan, I think uh, I, I dropped down or wrote a couple of very important points you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned something about talent scarcity, which we totally agree with you. You mentioned about uh, knowledge and awareness, and uh, that's an area uh, very obvious, and the managed services uh, area, and the inc continuous increase that. What we find, Hassan, is from, from customers in Bahrain and outside, they are saying that uh, uh, building uh, internal uh, resources or expertise also is ex exper uh, it's expensive. And uh, you, you, uh, you build that uh, talent, uh, you build the training, you build the capability, and the resource leaves us and they move on. I have to bring somebody else. I have to retrain and do it. That's a challenge. And that's why what we have decided is that we want to become closer and we want to have all the pool of talents with us uh, and grow and offer such services. But we want to be, uh, our commitment uh, in Bahrain, Hassan, is uh, to you and to everybody else is that we want to share knowledge, continuously share knowledge through uh, this event. So the main main event uh, or the big objective of uh, the Bahrain uh, uh, NGN Majlis is was to create uh, this shared awareness where we hear concerns from your side, we bring experts, and uh, here we have our partners, our close partners, Group IB, where they share their experience of our local market or what they see uh, and what they see abroad. They share the knowledge here. So we, our commitment is to continuously share that knowledge, Hassan, bring pool of talents and expertise, offer automation and services that can help and assist uh, uh, because the, the threats are, as you mentioned, are, 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 are increasing and we are trying our best to assist in that area and we have a pool of expertise to help in that area. So I just wanted to thank you. I think uh, your, your comments were very valuable. I, I kept a note of them here with me and, uh, and uh, I promise you that we will continuously have this event. This is an event that team has uh, promised that this will be a continuous event where we share knowledge, where we hear feedbacks, where we bring uh, I would say build a community here in Bahrain, equip them or, or bring latest information uh, with them. And uh, I thank all who have participated. And I thank obviously our partners, Group IB. I thank especially Tom, uh, Tim Bobak for, uh, for his valuable information. I thank my team. I thank Ilya and all of the team who are uh, behind all of this event. I wish all the success to everybody. We promise you we will continuously enhance this event and just I just want to thank all of you for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yaqub. Thank you very much. All, all the best. best. Thank and you. And uh, last suggestion, send a calendar, like uh, not a calendar, send a plan to everyone. Like make it uh, visible how often you will do this uh, session to everyone else, to, to provide the session to, to, the, to the region and to the expertise in the region. Uh, the more you provide it, the more you will hear ideas, the more concerns you know about, and this will help you enhance your services and will, will 
most probably generate more leads for you also in NGN. Thank you. Totally sir. agree. And with it's you. my pleasure to be to be with you and, and attend any session you want me to attend. It's my pleasure to help you anytime. You need. This is a great honor for us. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Really Thank you, Ilya. Thank Shukran. you, guys. Thank, Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, guys. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye.